Yeah, so uh, we heard a bit about insulin resistance this morning and fatty liver and ectopic fat, and I'm afraid I'm going to be going over some more of that. Uh, I'd just like to call out up front Gabor Ordosi from Hungary, and I think Tommy Wood referred to him earlier. He runs the lower insulin, insulin group, and he's an exceptional individual, and he's a machine for uh, analyzing scientific papers. And I think he's worked out a lot of the insulin resistance mechanistic paths. So I've worked with him for several months. So just a quick disclosure, my work is supported by David Bobbitt, who's an Irish entrepreneur, very successful, um, who started the Heart Disease Awareness Group in Ireland. And he's funded a film, uh, a movie, The Widowmaker, for a couple of million dollars. And he's helping myself and Dr. Gerber put together a book. And we have publishers now, I believe. It'll be out later in the year. But I'm just disclosing that we're supported uh, by David. And a very important thing, I'm going to be talking about calcium scanning later. And David, although he's promoting that technology and it's fantastic, he has no financial ties whatsoever. It's just philanthropy. So the content, I'll, I'll actually breeze through that for speed. So working with Gabor, these are some of the slides I was using in a talk last month in Miami, uh, and even some like this. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to spare you that stuff, because I reckon this could happen. <laughs> uh, and, me, and me yet still happen. So anyway. So part one, the exposure. So what kind of exposure have we got in the population for the problem of hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance? And I'm going to bring in a guy here, Dr. Joseph Kraft, who started off as a medical captain in World War II and did some extraordinary work with insulin assays in the 70s and 80s. And sadly, he actually passed away last Tuesday. But he, came, he became a great friend of myself and Dr. Gerber. Um, he wrote a book, Diabetes Epidemic and You, and I believe everyone should read it. When I read it, I was amazed, and I decided that we had to go and interview him, myself and Dr. Gerber. But he also said something of many uh, powerful quotes. He said, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, they are not combatants, they are one and the same. And this is important because there are some states where you have insulin resistance in the absence of hyperinsulinemia, and that can be fine. But in pathogenic states, they are often two sides of the same coin. Here is myself and Dr. Gerber interviewing him. Joe was 94 in summer of 15. And I'll go through some of his work. He had a diabetes in situ test. And basically, people would be familiar with a glucose tolerance test. You take the glucose and you measure the gl blood glucose in the next couple of hours. It's a pretty good test. But what Kraft was doing was measuring the insulin response over a full five hours to the glucose. And he made some very good observations on his first thousand patients. He realized there were multiple patterns of insulin response. The first one was pattern one, euinsulinemia, healthy, non-diabetic. But only around 20% of the eventual 15,000 people he tested actually got this good response. Most of them got one of the other patterns, which are all hyperinsulinemia or diabetes in situ. They were essentially diabetic via their insulin signaling, but 90% of these failures would pass a blood glucose test and over 50% would even pass a glucose tolerance. And as I say, he did 14,300 people. And he stated that this was the earliest laboratory diagnosis for diabetes, and I believe it is to this day, but no one's really using it. Just springing to the present day, we've got uh, analysis here of Japanese Americans, 2013. And they actually did craft type patterns, and they didn't credit them, but they were essentially the same thing. And you'll notice on the left-hand side, that's kind of a good pattern. And 11 years later, after patterning all these people, they went back to see, well, how many got full-blown diabetes? And only 3% of the pattern one people did. Pattern two or, and three had four to five times the rate of full-blown 11 years later. And the high pattern guys, up to a half of them had full blown. So you can imagine how powerful a test this is that it can predict between one cohort being a couple of percent versus another cohort being half of them. It's a huge test. It's not being used.
And if we go to the present day, a study just last year, I believe, over half of the US adults are now pre-diabetic or diabetic. Now, pre-diabetic, diabetic, diabetes in situ, hyperinsulinemic, they're all a spectrum. And to an engineer, which is what I am, they're all the same pathology, essentially. In fact, calling them different names confuses the issue. And if you used Kraft's more accurate laboratory test, myself and Dr. Gerber reckons maybe two-thirds of adult Americans are essentially diabetic. And that's interesting because diabetes is known to be the primary driver of cardiovascular issues by a country mile, and two-thirds of the people have it. Right? So, Kraft said many years ago, those with cardiovascular disease not identified with diabetes are simply undiagnosed. Now that's a powerful statement. Not all cardiac disease is this hyperinsulinemia problem, but so much is it should be the primary focus as opposed to cholesterol. And I'll bring a, a little bit of a validation of Kraft's view of the world. So this study was done in Europe. It had 4,004 cardiac patients from ages 18 to 80 across 24 countries. Now that's a fantastic selection of cardiovascular patients. But what they did is they knew diabetes drove heart disease like nothing else. So they removed all the diabetics first and looked at 4,004 non-diabetics to see what was going on with those guys. But what they found when they actually analyzed their blood was a third of them were diabetic <laughs> after removing all the non-diabetics, right? And when they looked deeper, they saw that another third were high risk for diabetes, which is diabetic, right? <laughs> so two thirds of the non-diabetic heart disease victims across the huge age range and all the countries were diabetic. And I would guess the remaining 34%, not many would pass a craft test. So there you go. And the latest data, February the 15th, just a week before Joe <coughs> passed away, you can see here from Medscape that the coronary vascular disease burden is shockingly high. And they're 15 years ahead of projections. And they've commented there, the burden of CVD is growing so fast, it's outpacing our ability to deal with it. But Kraft could have told them a long time ago that this was coming. So what about hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance versus cholesterol? right, where most of the focus has been for decades. And here I'd like to bring in a cholesterol expert, one of America's foremost lipidologists. And he clarified a couple of things a couple of years ago for me, which I knew already, but it was nice to hear a cholesterol expert say them. And what he said is, in reality, the majority of coronary vascular disease events are due to insulin resistance. And that's good to hear from a cholesterol guy, right? And he said LDL, the classic LDL, is a near worthless predictor for cardiovascular issues. And again, I knew that from all my analysis, but it's great to hear it from a guy like Tom. The way I put it is, if this is LDL as a drival or a causal driver of cardiovascular disease, then this is hyperinsulinemia. It's the elephant in the room. So part two, I'm going to go into uh, some of the paths and the pathways, and I've kind of simplified them <coughs> a little. So <laughs> I'm not going to go through this one. <laughs> it's just to show, and I'm sure Tommy Wood will like this, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit on the gut. Uh, but basically, the gut is an endocrine organ, right? So you have entero endocrine components in the gut, and it releases a whole load of hormones and there's nerve connections to the brain, to the pancreas, to the liver, and it crosstalks. It's extremely powerful signaling uh, component in the body. And I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction. Here you can see the stomach up top, and then the upper duodenum of your small intestine has K cells, and they release GIP, which is glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide. And it's a very powerful hormone that actually triggers your insulin response. So most of your insulin response to glucose is triggered from here. And I show it there. It increases your insulin hugely. And it also, there's GIP sensors in the adipose tissue. And there's a function there to promote lipogenesis. So GIP is not something you want to jack up. Yeah? 
Down further in your ileum, when the food has moved on down, there's GLP-1 and PYY. And these are very important signalers also. But I've put a green circle because these things are generally good. They promote pancreatic function, cell life in the pancreas for the beta cells. The PYY acts through the brain to suppress appetite. So the food signaling down here could generally be seen as something you want to enhance. So what drives up the GIP, the one on the left? Well, it's carbohydrates, which are pretty much glucose, particularly refined carbohydrates. And fat and glucose combo is pretty bad too. The fat potentiates the uh, glucose driving of GIP. But fat on its own doesn't really drive up GIP. So that's something to keep in mind. Jason mentioned earlier gastric bypass surgery, and it's actually quite stunning how it can reverse diabetes. But here on the left is what I just talked to you about, and here is the most powerful gastric bypass surgery. And you'll notice that they reduce the stomach size up top, you can see that, but they also bypass the whole area where the GIP is expressed and they actually enhance the food triggering of the L cells where GLP-1 and PYY are expressed. So you can see this, it takes away the bad and it enhances the good. And actually, this particular operation is by far the most powerful of all the gastric because the ones that just compress the stomach don't have nearly the success or speed as this one. And I would say, and the authors of the study would say it's because of this, bypassing the K cells. So you don't want to cut up your stomach. So can you do similar stuff that's beneficial with diet? And this is a nice little study because it shows the control food pyramid diet here racks up GIP and consequently insulin. But the paleo type di diets they made that were far less processed, they had a high and a lower fat one, you can see the GIP is not excited at all. And that's a good thing. And if you look at the PYY, you can see the paleo type diets jacked up PI, PYY, and that's a great thing. It suppresses appetite, and GLP-1 went up as well, and that enhances your pancreas function. And the control diets didn't do much at all. So there are dietary interventions that can help a hell of a lot, like surgery. And other studies show that the cellular structure of the food is crucial that if the cellular structure is all intact, you tend to flow down further in the small intestine and you trigger the beneficial signaling molecules. So now we're going to look at some refined mice. <laughs> and do you, I don't really like mice, but do you, does refined food make refined mice or fat mice? So this is a great little study. And you can see here that the bottom graph is the weight gain for mice on proper standard chow. And the upper graphs are the mice that got sugar and fat, which they call Western, or a high fat diet, which has always got sugar. They tell you it's a high fat diet that screws up the mouse, but it's always got sugar, right? So that's very deceitful and it annoys me. But anyway, so you make fat mice with these diets. But what happens when you grind up each of these diets? Don't mix them together. You grind up each one into powder and you let the same mice ad-lib feed on them. What do you think will happen? Do you think the good chow pellets um, standard will become worse? Probably. And the fat ones can't get much worse, right? Well, this one even surprised me, because that's what happened. <laughs> I didn't even have to label the plot lines, because they're all on top of each other. So I think it illustrates, even though these are mice, not humans, the immense potential influence of grinding up food in a way it would not have been done evolutionarily. And uh, I think it's a great experiment. Here's one for the bread heads, you guys who like bread. And here they got white wheat bread in the orange, glucon added rye bread with extra fiber in the yellow, and whole kernel rye. And the GIPs, you can see there's a very big difference in the response, and accordingly insulin response. So the whole kernel rye bread was way better. Now, I would, still wouldn't eat that stuff, but it's way better. But what's interesting is, in the analysis of the experiment, they realized it wasn't the fiber that helped. 
And it wasn't the gastric emptying effect because they gave them all paracetamol and checked the transit through the gut. It was simply the cellular structure of the food. Under the microscope, the cellular structure. That gave the whole effect here. So again, refining is hugely important. So now for my kids, I'm going to do some of these diagrams. <laughs> um, so we have our pancreas, we have our adipose, adipose tissue, which is hugely important in the early stages of insulin resistance. And I learned a lot of this from Gabor. We, we sent a lot of papers to each other. And you got your liver, your muscular tissue. And here's a healthy person. And they release moderate amounts of insulin, pulsatile, with ideally well-spaced meals. Okay, so that's good. And insulin doesn't just shove glucose into cells. It does a huge amount of controlling functions. I won't go through them all here. But for instance, it back controls into the pancreas and suppresses glucagon to avoid inappropriate gluconeogenesis in the liver. So a huge amount of signaling involved with insulin. Also, insulin uh, promotes GLUT4 translocation in your adipose tissue, and that's very important. Not to mop up glucose, but the act of bringing glucose in triggers de novo lipogenesis. And that, through CHREBP beta, creates lipokines, or systemic signaling fat molecules, that crosstalk to the liver and actually enhance the whole control system. And if you damage that uh, crosstalk, you're going to have problems. So let's say this healthy person takes in carbohydrates, which is just glucose. I mean, there's some nutrients in there, but let's be honest, just glucose. And they take in too much, especially if it's refined over a period of time. Well, that's the first punch to your system. It won't knock you out, it won't kill you. Some people do this for years, decades. But it's going to raise your insulin. And it's going to raise your insulin more than would be ideal. And an effect that can happen with that is the adipose tissue can become somewhat insulin resistant. And the GLUT4 translocation and that de novo lipogenesis can become impacted. And that has an effect on the liver, right? Because this is all interconnected. And the liver can become more insulin resistant as a result of this signaling. And somewhere along the way, you're going to begin to build up that ectopic fat that was talked about earlier. Now, if you take fructose, which is, it was explained earlier, half, fruct or half of sugar is fructose, half is glucose. But if you take in fructose, especially too much, well, that has a direct effect on the liver of causing insulin resistance in that organ, right? And that's quite established. And that's a second punch to your system. And that will enhance the insulin resistance and will enhance more insulin release to uh, by, or bias to resolve that situation. So they're kind of two sides of a coin, like we said earlier. And there's a lot of other things that can enhance insulin resistance, and I won't read them all out, but you'll see some of your favorites there, I'm sure. And if you keep doing those, that's a kick in the ass to your system on top of the first two, two punches. So now you're bringing in three deleterious things into a human machine that was not really designed from them or for them. And you will, at some point, get muscular insulin resistance and diacylglycerols, which affect PKC isoforms in the muscle and cause further insulin resistance, can begin to build up. And you hopefully will see here now, by pushing this system, you've got a self-reinforcing feedback loop that the more hyperinsulinemia, the more insulin resistance to manage energy flux and protect the body, the more insulin resistance, more tendency to express more insulin to continue to try and do the job. And it keeps reinforcing itself, and the control system is gone. And if you keep doing that, you'll hit a later stage, a very serious stage, where your adipose tissue will begin to recruit macrophage. You'll have hypertrophy. Your adipose tissue cells will be increasing in size. And some people in late stage, even before they're diagnosed, up to half the weight of their adipose tissue is macrophage. I mean, you can see very heavy guys who are insulin sensitive versus insulin resistant. The insulin sensitive, their macrophage, there's very few in their adipose tissue. The insulin resistant guys, there's macrophage everywhere, right? And once that comes in, that will start to cause lipolysis and release free fatty acids. But interestingly, although these guy, or this guy I'm showing here, is well on his way to a heart attack, and millions will get their heart attack and go to the grave without being diagnosed with diabetes, but they're diabetic. Their glucose is still under control, right? So you might want to see the end game. 
So the end game is, after many, many years of this, your pancreas, which has had outrageous demands of insulin, right, to manage this system, this dysfunction, eventually tells you to piss off. <laughs> and rightly so. You know, I don't blame the pancreas, because what's been done is criminal, okay? So you flag your insulin falls. When your insulin level falls from the massive amounts you were requiring, you get brake failure. And the insulin can no longer stop the lipolysis or the breaking up of triglyceride in your adipose tissue. And when that happens, you get a flow of free fatty acids and glycerol to your liver, right? Even when you're fasting, right? You're still going to get this lipolysis. And when that happens, your liver cannot stop making glucose because the substrate push of free fatty acid and glycerol will bypass insulin signaling at this stage and pure substrate push, and the Schulman lab has done some great work on this, will drive gluconeogenesis. And when your liver glucose goes out of control, finally, it's game over. And you'll get your diabetes diagnosis. But you're gonna need exogenous insulin now injected into you to try and keep a cap on this mess. And the tragedy is, your diagnosis, this could have been shown 20 years before using basic methods or the craft test, but it's not done. So I'm gonna to go to part three, and I hope I'm on time. I want to go through the calcification score because you would like to, for heart disease, not just have risk factors to tell you you might have a problem, right? Because they're very noisy. You'd like to have something like a PET scan to say, hey, yeah, you've got a disease, I can see it. That's what calcification does. So the developers of the calcification test back in the 80s are heroes in my mind and in my sponsor's mind. And uh, they had a lot of trouble getting it adopted for many political reasons. And the movie The Widowmaker, which is now only a dollar on Vimeo, is a fantastic movie. And it gives the full fascinating history of why calcification is grossly underused to, to this day. But here's the calcification scan, and on the left we've got a healthy guy, and you can see the green circle, there's no calcification in the coronary arteries. And on the right hand side we see a similar age guy, quite a lot of calcium. Now the calcium is only recruited in as a repair process, right, for atherosclerotic arteries that have a danger of bursting. Your body recruits calcium, makes bony structures, and shores up the damaged areas. So it's not the calcium that's a bad thing, it reflects your body's attempt to repair, and it tells you you've got a major issue. And if you have no calcium, you're in good shape. And that's actually Jeff Gerber's scan. <laughs> See, he's in good shape there at 54. So we'll go on. We'll compare a calcium score for telling you what's going to happen in your future versus framing them. Now, framing them is the cluster of risk factors put together. I call it risk factor bingo. You know, it'll give a rough idea of what might happen. But engineers would never use it, because it's only a proxy. But here's 10% people in Framingham, and they're talking about medicating these guys now, all of them. 10% risk over the next 10 years of having a heart event. But what if you tested all of those with a real test, the calcium scan? Well, you'll find out the people who come in with a low score actually have a very low risk. They're pretty okay. People with a medium have quite a high risk. They've got to do something. And people with a very high score, like David Bobbitt, have a massive issue. And David Bobbitt had a 5% framing him. He had no risk factors, but he had a 950 calcium score. And he had 90 and 70% blockages. Of course, he found out later he was diabetic, right, from carbohydrate. But anyway, so this test will tell you, muddy framium takes a guess, calcium sees the disease. It's an engineering test. None of those risk factor bingo. So there's loads of work done in calcification over decades. I can tell you that high versus low score is roughly a 10x risk. It blows away risk factors in terms of predicting because it sees the disease. You can even take middle risk people in Framingham where most heart attacks occur. You can scan them and you can put 20% into high risk and 40% into low risk you can completely recategorize the people. But in framing them, they're just all middle risk. Junk. Uh, calcium seeds the disease. Score progression, because the calcium is not necessarily a problem, it just reflects 
the progressive disease of atherosclerosis. It shows you've got a lot of fire burning inside. Here's a study that looked at people with a high score at the start, but they were progressing and getting a higher score every year, right? That's really bad. And that was the mortality, or not mortality, heart, major heart event uh, curve showing around half of them heading for heart attacks, right, from actual observations of events. But the same people with a high starting score, right, in bad shape, but their calcium did not increase over the subsequent several years. They had that kind of event rate. So generally speaking, if you have a high score, it's not the end of the world. It tells you what you've done in the past has driven atherosclerosis. But going forward, if you stabilize it, you can get your risk level down, similar to someone who has a zero score. So a lot of hope here. Here's the very latest data just for you guys, February the 8th, 2017 report. And usually calcification is done in middle age, but this is actually done on young guys. And you'll see on the left there, 4% risk factor young guys. Do you see the difference between low and high calcium in terms of the events they're going to have? You won't see that with cholesterol. You've got nearly a 15x difference in risk. And the 5 to 11% risk rate, you can see again a massive difference between a zero score and a high score. So calcium just blows away the other stuff. And that's why it's obligatory for all US presidents and astronauts, because they're important. But it's a $100 test, so even like ordinary people could have it, right? <laughs> I'll show you one last uh, graph, and basically from left to right you see 0, 1, 2, or more than 3 risk factors. And you can see for many of the people, the risk factors don't predict huge differences in the height of those blocks. But going back into the page is calcification from low to high. And that's the thing that really tells you. If you look on the far left, guys with not risk factors, they could be anything from huge risk to very low. But you need to have a calcium scan to know. And I'd ask a question, if CAC score obliterates the risk factors and actually sees arterial disease, which it does, any risk factor you tell me is a risk factor, it a goddamn better line up with CAC and correlate with it. Is that fair? I think that's fair. So why doesn't LDLC correlate at all with calcification? This study from 2009 hasn't got much press, but they have 20 studies where you have LDL and you have coronary calcification scores from EBT. And they noted LDL doesn't correlate. You can see the middle panel there in one particular study that took 10. No relationship. I love the one on the bottom right. Familial hypercholesterolemics are the poster child for LDL as poison, right? You know, those guys. But in this study of familial hypercholesterolemics, the really high LDL FH guys versus the low, there was no relationship to their degree of arterial calcification. It didn't even work for the FH guys because they have a lot of other things going on, not just LDL. So I think this is very, very telling. And for me, I knew LDL already was almost a farce, as Ted Neiman calls it, but uh, th this closes it. No engineer would be using that, ever. Diabetic physiology, however, is the most massive predictor of CAC score. So again, speaking back to what I said earlier, it's the number one reason for calcification. Those guys burn up and calcify, and LDL doesn't even show up, and yet we spent decades looking at it. So it's a shame. So I'm going to wrap up now with striking at the root. I believe in the Pareto principle, that you focus on the 20% of the things that will give you 80% of the benefit. So what would I personally prioritize? Well, I drew this little tree. I'm not very artistic. And you can see it's the tree of chronic disease, right? Modern chronic disease. And we've got a lot of ugly fruit there. And I believe they're all, to some extent, affected or influenced by the taproot of insulin and leptin signaling when that's dysregulated. Right? I think that's a major route. I will acknowledge that fixing that route requires addressing many issues. It's not a one-trick pony. Nutrition, excessive carbs, sun, vitamin D, smoking drives up insulin, sleep, exercise. There's a lot of things you've got to fix. Some people have to do them all. I'll acknowledge there are other drivers and routes of chronic disease. It's not all insulin and leptin, that's fair enough. And then we'll bring in cholesterol, 
right? So cholesterol only actually influences cardiovascular disease, so already it's limited in its influence. But one thing that really worries me about cholesterol, and even to an extent the new advanced lipoproteins, is they're intimately connected to the pathology of insulin signaling, okay? So how do you separate them? Much dyslipidemia only reflects insulin and leptin signaling issues and fatty liver and the things that were talked about all day, right? So I wonder, has this cholesterol driver route, if it is indeed a significant route, has it been overnourished in the past few decades to make us hear so much about it? <laughs> Who am I to say? Thank you.